also be used with any species of fish just because some fish will swallow a bait hard and it gets lodged very deep. So it's much easier to hold the mouth open with a tool and, and reach in with pliers or other uh, hook removal devices and, and get the hook out. And if a fisherman is practicing catch and release, then the fish is, is more likely to be released healthier than if it's a problem to get the hook out. Welcome to Invention Stories on YouTube. My name is Robert Bear, and today our interview is with Keith Lawrence, the inventor of the OutTool Fish Mouth Spreader. This episode was previously shared on the Invention Stories podcast July 26, 2018. And be sure to stay until the end to hear what has transpired since. You might be surprised. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Now let's roll. If somebody is offering to do the work for you, Ron, if somebody's offering to teach you how to do it yourself, then that's a better route. Keith Lawrence returned from a fishing trip to Canada where he found the fish mouth spreaders they used didn't work very well. He thought there should be a better way to help fishermen remove the fishing hook from the fish's mouth. So he worked through several designs and prototypes before working with the new product development center at Oklahoma State University. I'd like to start off by asking, did you grow up in like the country? What kind of environment did you grow up? I grew up in an environment sort of right in between. A little small town that I grew up in, still live in, is Ponca City, Oklahoma. It's not big enough to have suburbs, but I did live just outside of the city in a small rural community and had access to lots of open area and country roads to play and roam and actually have a good time and work hard and play hard also. Were you like an engineering sort of young person? Did you like to pull apart the TV or the radio and see how they work? Well, to some extent, yes. Not uh, probably deep into things like uh, electronics, but probably more on the side of tearing into some mechanical things like that. Did you go fishing often as a kid? Oh, a bit. Not a great deal. We always had fishing equipment and opportunities, uh, farm ponds, creeks, rivers, uh, lakes nearby. So we did have that opportunity, but no one in my family was actually a very avid fisherman. Uh, and nor, nor am I to, as to this day am I that. It's just one of those things that I had an idea for from a fishing trip and developed from there. I read that you were fishing with your dad up in Canada. Is that correct? You were yes. Fishing walleye and pike? That's right. Do you fish for that locally or is that just up there in Canada? There are some walleye hybrids here in the local area, but pike uh, don't survive this far south. I don't know enough about uh, freshwater fishing. So do you do a lot of catch and release? Is that why you developed a, a better... Uh... Not necessarily. Really, uh, the, the idea came from, as, as I said earlier, the, this fishing trip in Canada for pike and muskie. And there's a common tool that they use in that, in that environment for holding a fish's mouth open. In essence, it's, a, it's like a giant safety pin. Safety pin has a coil spring at the bottom, and this tool that they have is has got a couple of 90 degree hooks out at the end of the arms, and that's what is inserted into a fish's mouth, and that opens the mouth and holds it open so that those when you're getting the hook or the lure out, the fish can't chomp down on on your hand. And believe me, those uh, teeth are razor sharp, and they can really make a, a bad day fast. So I just saw that what that, that coil spring type spreader is just not very adequate for, for doing the job. Invention Stories on YouTube is sponsored by the Chin Up Strip Company. We previously have shared our interview with Dale Miller, who invented chin up strips to ensure he only breathed through his nose while sleeping. No more dry mouth, no more loud mouth snoring. Just imagine waking up feeling better rested. But don't take my word for it. The Chin Up Strip Company is now offering a free trial pack for you to try for yourself absolutely free, including free shipping in the United States. To order your free trial pack, please visit www.inventionstories.com forward slash free. And to your point or to your question about catch and release, this tool does appeal to fishermen 
for catch and release. Uh, a lot of a lot of bass fishermen, who are that are plentiful in this area, they do a lot of catch and release. They are um, responsible sportsmen, and when the fish are small, they want to release them back into the environment. They want to do the same thing, even with the large fish, in many times, so that they spawn and have uh, increase the the fish in the lakes or the ponds and the rivers. So um, if, if a fish really swallows a lure deeply, even if it doesn't have teeth, my tool will open the mouth wide and hold it open so the fisherman can get that hook out and cause the least amount of damage. And what's the name of your tool? It's the out tool, is that correct? Yes, uh, out tool, just spelled O-U-T. And, and honestly, that was just a working name I, I came up with, out is simply a, an acronym for Open Up Tool. It was just kind of a silly acronym so that during the process of the project, it had a name, but also it, it kind of gained a life of its own and the people that have brought it to market just continued to use that name. Ah, it's a smart name. You know, it's it's uh, it's clever. Three letters out, and you can kind of remember it. You're trying to get your tackle out of the fish mouth. and uh, it, It's a bit descriptive, yes. I like it. Okay, so you were up there fishing, and were you using a tool that wasn't working as well? And you thought, I could, I mean, what was the aha moment? Oh, uh, it was, uh, yes, using this coil spring. Uh, I think the main thing was using a coil spring spreader. If you think about the nature of a coil spring or a safety pin, when you compress it, that's when it has the most force. Well, in a small fish, you had to compress it, and that's what you exerted the most force on a small fish, and then as you needed to spread it wider for a, a large fish, actually you lose force because the spring expends its energy. And so really it was just contrary to what was needed for the different sizes of fish. And I just got to thinking that, well, actually there was a, one of the fishermen on the trip had an antique tool to do this that worked more on the principle that I've used in the out tool. And so I got to thinking about it. Uh, his was rather large and clumsy and, and literally was probably made in the 1920s or 30s. So I put my thinking cap on as, I, as we came home and, and uh, months and years went by and I came up with uh, just a better, a better way to do it, a smaller compact package, better ergonomically shaped item. And, and so that's the, the item we have today. So it just kind of bounced around in your head until one day you started working on some prototypes. Is that how it went? Uh, yes, actually, that's that's right. Uh, I really couldn't get it out of my mind. And I, first of all, I just bent a couple of pieces of wire, literally bailing wire, into uh, a rough shape and saw that uh, if it pivoted in the right place and the, the handles were in the right place, uh, I had a configuration that I thought would work. And the next thing I knew that I needed was uh, some kind of a locking mechanism to blend into that. And one day I was in my brother's uh, woodworking shop and saw a hand clamp. And I kind of had an aha moment there that this locking hand clamp could be modified. And so that was really where the idea coalesced. It, it wasn't completely done, but it, uh, it coalesced into a how to put all the pieces together. I see that you've presented it to the New Products Development Center at Oklahoma State University. How did that come about? Did you already know about them, or did you find it through your research? Through my research, I found uh, out about the New Product Development Center. And what they're, uh, they exist to, to do just that, help, help people and small companies that have ideas, shape them, develop them, commercialize them. So they have a process. Uh, there's an application fee, and and a fairly lengthy process, or an application, I should say, that forces you to think about your product, think about what is out there competing with it in the marketplace, why your product is unique. And so once I did that, I was accepted, and they had they have individuals, students, many times that are uh, able to do some design work. They do some market research work. Uh, even uh, Oklahoma State University has the Oklahoma's uh, a patent library housed there so they also have uh, the ability to do some patent searching that sounds like a really good tool then uh, yeah very good tool yes yeah it sounds like a, you're a little bit of a business plan mixed in there with some really good assistance did they actually improve your prototype the students 
Well, actually, no, they, they didn't. Uh, but I can't can't say that it was any fault of theirs. Uh, they they took the early prototype that I had and and worked on it. And I think their best effort was that they encouraged me to move forward. That there wasn't a lot a lot of other products in the space that competed directly with it. But they also, as a, as any smart advisor would do, they they had some caution along with that to, oh, you know, bring it to market properly. But then at that point, they had to, that was the scope of what they do. Then I had to take it on further with, uh, towards uh, commercialization. I'd like to ask you about the patent process. When did you fill out your application? The patent application process actually started after I, I'll say, uh, graduated from the Inventors Assistance Service at Oklahoma State University. I had kept everything under uh, NDAs. I, I talked about it in only using NDAs with individuals. But at, at that point, I knew that I needed to have some kind of protection moving forward. I had learned about uh, patents and provisional patent applications. So decided to take that next step to file a provisional patent application and then, uh, then start to go forward uh, attempting to commercialize. How was the application process? Did you sail through on the first try? Did it cost what you thought or take as long as you imagined it? Well, of course, the provisional patent application, I did a lot of that work, but I did also collaborate with the patent attorney to get that process done. Uh, that part is, uh, as you well know, the, the provisional patent application is not a uh, not terribly expensive process to go through, keeping in mind that once that's filed, now you have one year to to try to commercialize it and or file for the utility patent. So during that time, I worked pretty hard to reach out to to companies that would, would be a good fit for licensing the product to. And have you received your utility patent? Uh, yes, we did receive the utility patent. It was after the after the one one year we, we well before the one year expired on the provisional, we did go ahead and file for the utility patent. And that was a fairly lengthy process and a lot, a lot of waiting, which honestly I don't really mind. I went ahead based on the patent pending status to to uh, work on commercialization and ultimately did have a license before the patent actually issued. And how did you obtain a licensing agreement? Again, just hard work, reaching out to, uh, to companies, going through uh, lots and lots of rejections. But I, I think I contacted anybody who was anybody in the fishing industry that made uh, tools and accessories for fishing that I knew about and could find and even learned about some that I couldn't find and and actually the company that I licensed to I had learned about and oh well, essentially had written them off because I just couldn't find out enough information about them uh, one day I circled back and saw my contact information I reached out to them and few months later, they were ultimately the ones to sign a licensing deal. Awesome. I'd like you to share with our viewers what your responsibilities are and what are their responsibilities. I won't give specific percentages, but it's very typical for licensing deals to be a you know, percentage of gross wholesale dollars. The thing to remember for inventors and product developers that most licensing deals are in the single digit percentage range. And that is because there's uh, so much upfront cost that the, the licensee is investing into the process that they need that much to be able to uh, commercialize the product. And the, the inventor, product developer, the, the intellectual property owner are actually taking a, a minor role back seat. Was that with Alliance Sports Group of Texas? Yes, sir. Uh, Alliance Sports Group, uh, they have a number of divisions. One of them is uh, fishing products division, and uh, that is named Quaro, Q-U-A-R-R-O-W, and uh, that is, uh, it is, it is marketed under that, uh, that banner. And where is it being sold? Well, the two biggest places that most of your listeners would, would recognize are Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Just this past week, I was in a Cabela's store in Oklahoma City, and uh, actually, my wife went in before I did, and she found it hanging on one of the retail pegs. So that was that was kind of exciting. Uh, about a year ago, we we found it in Bass Pro Shop in another city. So 
uh, that's been fun. It also goes, uh, it has gone out to uh, small mom and pop tackle shops uh, in the upper Midwest, in, uh, in Canada as well. So uh, slowly but surely, it, it's getting out there. What was that like, or how much fun was that to see your product on the shelf of a store for the first time? Like, wow, that's... That, you're, well, you're absolutely right. It's kind of a surreal moment. It does put a big smile on your face. And, of course, then, then about that time, a, a sales associate uh, comes over and asks if they can help. And, and uh, we talked about it and, and told them that, or I told him that I was the inventor and uh, he got a big charge out of that and had a, and actually became quite an advocate for the tool. He could see how it was useful and, and how it could help fishermen. So uh, right there in that store, I think we gained a, a real an advocate for the product. Did you ever consider manufacturing it and bringing it to the market yourself? Uh, no, Robert, I never did plan to manufacture it uh, and, and bring it to market myself. Uh, I mean, I certainly considered that, but I had studied different ways of bringing a product to the market and had learned through research and reading and online videos that even simple products can cost tens of thousands of dollars just to to make a mold. And uh, honestly, I just did not have those kind of resources to, to spend uh, on a product that might not even work, meaning that might not sell. So um, I, I just wasn't prepared to make a tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars investment. What would you say would be the hardest part of your licensing, your idea, your invention journey? I think the biggest thing was not having a process, not knowing a process to follow, a systematic process, step one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, to follow. And uh, eventually I did find that, and, and that was a very big help to understand that there, there is a systematic way to, to present products to, to companies and license them, or commercialize them for that matter, Many of the steps are, are the same until you reach a fork in the road and decide, okay, I'm going to license this or I'm going to um, commercialize this myself. So learning that there is a, is a good process or processes out there, that was also a big aha moment for me through the development of this. And what are you up to these days? Are you working on a new invention idea? Oh sure, I've got I've got other ideas that I've been working on. They aren't uh, currently not. I don't have anything in the uh, uh, fishing industry. My ideas tend to come to me when I am working on something or uh, enjoying a hobby, and I I've come across something that is is difficult, problematic, and I just think that there must be a simple solution. Uh, my ideas uh, for improvements on product or new products come to me more or less in the area of housewares, hardware, and sporting goods, kind of mechanical, hands-on widgets, I guess you might say. Sure. Little nuances that would make our lives a little bit uh, easier. That's right. That's exactly right. You mentioned some things that were a good use of your time, such as going to the New Product Development Center at Oklahoma State University being one of them. So what stands out as being a really good use of your time and what was not a good use of your time? Probably a, a bad use of time was just floundering a bit through the process, uh, not understanding the process before I realized there are some systematic processes to follow. So uh, I would encourage anyone that has product idea to get out there, find somebody that has a process and, and then get involved with it, whether it's a coaching process or a, a written process. Just learn what that, get involved with a local inventors group if there is one in individual's area. That's always a, a good place to learn the process and learn from other people's mistakes. Um, maybe being too fearful about product being stolen. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, I hear that a lot also. Uh, we, we inventors, product developers, are, are kind of a secretive bunch when it comes to our ideas. And, and so I think we need to talk about it more, at least in generalities, so that uh, we kind of build, uh, build, some, build some inertia to move things forward and get things going. So I think 
a bad use of time was just kind of floundering, not knowing what to do, finding those processes. And also, uh, I made the mistake of many inventors and product developers, and that is hiring someone to actually do the work. Most of the, and I should differentiate processes between educational type processes that teach you a system versus a company, product submission type company that says, pay us so much and we will do it for you. Honestly, those just uh, probably only in rare cases do product submission companies work. If somebody is offering to do the work for you, run. If somebody's offering to teach you how to do it yourself, then that's a better route. Well, that makes sense. Is there a season that you expect the sales to be highest? Would it be the, the summer? Uh, well, yes, probably is summer uh, from the springtime through the fall. Now, what's interesting, uh, though, is that up north where there are pike and muskie, those lakes freeze over and you'd think there's no fishing that goes on. Well, actually, they drill holes in the ice and they, they ice fish. So it, it still has a, a limited limited appeal. And then, as you mentioned, fishermen are all over the world and a lot of places have, have species of fish with some pretty nasty teeth. So uh, really, it's a product that could sell worldwide year-round. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Just to say that there are lots of uh, self-help things out there for inventors to look at. There's Google product development licensing, and there are hundreds if not thousands of videos. There are all kinds of podcasts on, on the Internet. Yours is one of them. So I think if people will search those out, I think they just can't go wrong with it. And I'll, I'll, if I can, if it's all right, I'll put in a plug. The process that I uh, discovered would be, is InventRight. It's probably a pretty well-known uh, system. They have a coaching system. I did not take advantage of their coaching system. I learned their processes through books and videos, and I think I would have benefited from their coaching system and actually hope to use utilize it someday but if anyone is is out there and struggling i'd say get online buy a couple of books and you can learn what you need to learn find mentors who you can trust who will give you honest feedback and then just get moving get out there and do it uh, yeah in 2018 i did license the uh the product the out tool uh, fish mouth spreader to a company and they were they were successful in producing it, bringing it to market, and they had it placed in Bass Pro Shops, they had it placed in Cabela's, and a, a number of other medium to small um, retail outlets, as well as selling it on their own website. And, and so that went along fine for a bit, but, but uh, towards 2019, into 2019, while there were still sales, I wasn't getting royalties. So actually, the the uh, licensing agreement was coming to an end, and since I wasn't getting uh, royalties, I just decided to let that uh, that agreement terminate. And uh, in the end, I did get the royalties that uh, that I expected, but it was you know trust had been lost a little bit with that particular licensee. So at the beginning of uh, 2020, when uh, COVID started, it was when when this all came back to me. So I had. Well, they had licensed it to it, but but uh, by by nature of a licensing agreement, uh, they were they were responsible for uh, building it, producing it, uh, and and so so um, they owned it. They owned that inventory. I had no I had no legal right to it. So. I, I purchased it at a, uh, I mean, they, were, they didn't have the right to sell it any longer, so it wasn't as, as useful to them. So we negotiated a, a, uh, a buyout, if you will, in lieu of the royalties that were owed me, and, uh, and, and I got the inventory back into my control. Now, an interesting thing about that, though, um, it, was, it was all packaged and branded under their, their brand. so. I had to, uh, as I was selling them, since I was selling them online, the package was less important. So I just depackaged them uh, and relabeled them with my own label and, and sent them out to, to customers directly. And where can the Out Tool Fish Mouth Spreader be purchased today? 
Okay, sure. Uh, well, the licensee has them on their website, and the licensee is www.opros, that's O-P-R-O-S, gear.com, oprosgear.com, and uh, uh, filter through the site and find uh, tools and accessories, and, and you'll find the out tool. I think through the whole experience, one thing I did learn is that licensing is definitely the route I want to go. I found that as really as simple of a process as it is to sell online, there's a lot more to it than people realize. To get people looking at the website, to get people compelled to see it and, and want it and buy it uh, was was challenging, was hard. and. Uh, and so those those expenses of doing that, the, the website development, the website maintenance, that goes on every every day, every week, every month, no matter how many how many units are sold. So I would say that uh, keeping keeping that pipeline full is, is a was a big challenge, and and it just I, I realized I found out that I don't really have a passion for. The business side of it. I have a passion for product development. So, so from here on out, when I come up with product ideas, uh, I intend to license them, or or they're just going to sit on the shelf because I do not uh, myself personally want to be in the venturing side of things.